Welcome to Ask GMBN Tech. This is our weekly show, it's Q&A format. You ask the questions and we hopefully give you the answers you need. Uh, if you've got any tech related questions, get them in, in the comments underneath. Use that hashtag Ask GMBN Tech or you could email them into hellotech at gmbn.com. Okay, so first up, I'm gonna fire a question at you, Henry. Uh, it's from Ryan Goff. Power links, are they specified for certain speeds? Um, are any of them compatible with other speeds, even as a bodge or to get you home? Well, the different speeds of the chain normally is in reference, to basically the higher the speed, the narrower the chain is. Yeah. So you can, and I know people that have put, say, a nine speed quick link, on a 10 speed chain yeah. and it's got a bit of slack just to get you home. Get you home, yeah. Um, but you wouldn't be able to go the other way around because the interface wouldn't be able to click in and pair up. Yeah, because sure. the power link would itself be too narrow. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I know, I know I've know, i heard of people doing that, you know, just to, like I said, get them home and no dramas really. Yeah, of course the other, you could go old school and actually just split the chain and rejoin it. But again, even now, by pushing one of those pins out, because a lot of the pins have got a chamfer to them or they've got a slight taper, it's never going to be brilliant, so what you're going to need to is make a note of where that join is, uh, yeah. just like you would with the power link, yeah. and put a suitable one on where you do get home. But chains have got a lot better for it. I, don't, I haven't broken a chain in a little while. Are I you? don't want to talk about breaking chains. Yeah, so you've got, you got a fair few more watts in the old legs, the old Dodster. <laughs> I think it's more um, being unlucky. <laughs> I, don't, I don't go through the gears like Neil does. I was gonna... You see him pedal away the other day? <laughs> go, 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 and you're like, oh, oh don't do that, you can break a chain. But yeah, I have broken a lot of chains in the past. Um, so I tend to try and look after my chains and always use the correct power link or the correct joining pin or whatever it is. Just pay attention to it and you'll be right. Nice. So I've got a question for you then from King Vita or Vita. King Vita, there we go. I have a Fox 36 Floke factory at 160 millimeters, two seasons old, and it makes a knack sound when I do a stoppy, go hard on the front brake or dropping the wheel down after a wheelie. I check everything what comes in my mind, wheels, axle, brakes, and even exchange the headset completely. It still sounds like breaking wood in a fireplace, which Ooh. is a lovely, a nice yeah. term. Yeah, I know that, that is sounds, what it sounds like. Yeah. Any advice how I can check the forks? Yeah, okay, well, the, you've obviously said you've tried everything. The first thing I would have said would be lower headset cup. Uh, and even if you've changed the headset, your frame could still be overlaced very slightly. So that is still one last thing. Um, but if it's, if it's the fork, more than likely it could be the steerer tube in the crown mm -hmm. itself, like the crown steerer upper unit. So they're basically press fitted at the factory. And on occasion, you're gonna get one that can work its way loose. It's quite unlikely uh, to happen in a massive batch, but you do get them. I've had one in the past on a RockShox Lyric that managed to work its way loose. And it was actually under warranty. RockShox covered that, it wasn't an issue. Yeah. But you might be unlucky enough to be outside of warranty, but I'm pretty sure they would still help you out to a yeah. degree. It it's worth asking. It happens a lot in steeper places where you do a lot of front wheel braking. Yep. And a really good way to test it is you wanna be doing something, yeah, like hit hits a curb or something like that because it will force the wheel back. And you might Pick hear it back, yeah, and, and then, then you, you wanna jump. drop it and drop off the Go curb. Go the other way. Um, if it is just, I mean, I've got a bit of a dodgy bodge, should I say it? Uh, yeah, we can, uh, we can, you can recommend something I wouldn't recommend, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, if you want to quieten it, if it's only a little quick, and this is not, this is being sensible, you can turn the fork upside down, leave it overnight in a vice, and drop some thin um, thread lock in there, and it will stop the creaking. It's a good idea. Like, pretend, sometimes it stops the creaking, I should say. But it's not the same as a new steer, and that would be my first. Yeah, definitely. Head to your bike shop first, yeah, totally. see what advice you can get, and there'll, there'll be a part number written, sometimes on the front, sometimes underneath, mm. and sometimes on the back of that unit, and it'll correlate to the year it was manufactured, and they'll know if there was problems at that point. Yeah. Um, yeah, and like Henry said, if it doesn't work, you don't want to pay the money, that could be a good hack yeah, to I, I don't want any lawsuits. Keep going. <laughs> but you're dealing with safety at the end of the yeah, day, so I, it's I cool. probably wouldn't risk it, to be fair. Yeah. If it's making a lot of noise, just sack it off. Okay, um, I am Eagle. Can oh. I use CO2 in my forks instead of air? Well, there was we that- We had this, we've got yeah, back, actually, yeah. There was that video of Jared Graves, EWS Whistler, I believe, just, you know? Yep. Um, the, the amount of, Air in a suspension unit, although it's very high pressure, is very small. Yeah. And um, I don't know, do you know what a CO2 canister is rated at? Um, I don't, to it's be honest. No, but um, we, we did actually pick this up before and I've tried it and you can do it, but it's really easy to cock it up, basically, mm. and get it wrong. And like Henry says, the amount of air that's trying to get out in one hit is 
far different to a shock pump or a pump. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't risk it. It's like a literally get you home. Yes. If you absolutely have to. I absolutely. And even to. then, if you you are going to rely on having to do that, make sure you've got one of the little interconnectors that you can adjust, um, not just like literally push it on and have the air out. There's yes, various ones on the market. If you've got a little twist knob on yes. it, you can you can finely tune the amount of air that comes out, or at least finely tune the air that rushes out. Yeah, it's like I've heard people of doing blowing up um, track pumps on mm -hmm. because it's actually the, the track pump isn't as rated as high. Yeah, you know you don't realise just how much pressure's in them. Yeah, I actually remember in my first ever bike shop. This is my first ever day on the job. This guy came in and said, "Oh, my my shock's not working." And I said, oh, what's, what's wrong there? He just went, I, I don't know, it went bang. And I said, oh, heavens, what, what pressure are you running it? He said, the compressor went that bloody quick. <laughs> yeah, that says it all. Oh! CO2 does the same job as a compressor in a portable format. So, uh, take heed of that information. Yeah. Uh, all right, next up is from Carl Stanton. Uh, what's the best way to bed pads in um, after using the sandpaper technique? It's the one thing I've never got to feel right. I can bleed them fine, get them aligned properly, etc., but I can never get them to lock up. I was always told to ride up and down, grab the brakes and stop without locking up 15 to 20 times and then chuck water on them. Mm -hmm. um, I always seem to end up with brakes that feel glazed. Ugh, dreadful days. Um, yeah. I seem to lack any real bite. Um, I've got a 2019 Santa Cruz Hightower LT, bought new, which came with SRAM Codars. Um, I know the brakes are good, it's obviously how I'm bedding them in. Hmm. Questions? Quite, I mean, there's there's a there's a lot of there's a lot things of things. in there. For me personally, I like to just wear the pads until they're sitting parallel to mm -hmm. the braking to the rotor. Um, I don't really get involved with too much else. You do see people doing the various tricks. I don't understand the water thing. I think the the water thing and some people put mud I've seen on some, mm. all sorts of stuff. I think that's like a rescuing a duff pad yeah. rather than bedding in a, a fresh pad. Yeah, because I'd imagine the water would be there to exaggerate the wear, so yeah. it gets parallel sooner. Yeah, um, I I would do it dry personally yeah, every dry. time. Yeah, and what you said to start with, you know, pacing up and down the road and stopping firmly fifteen or twenty times normally does it. Because mm. what you want is some material from the pads to deposit on the rotor, so they're kind of they're they're equally matched. I guess is a right yes. word to say. But what potentially could have happened is imagine riding a bike and not bedding in the pads, so the yeah. pads get slightly glazed. Yeah. Which then glazes the rotor, then you yeah. bed in the pads properly. Yeah. But then they're actually always vibrating off the rotor. Yeah. Um, you get so, the turkey goblin noise when it happens as well. Yeah, so oh, maybe oh. sandpaper the rotor. Try and not do it in the direction of braking. Um, and sometimes, if you do find this is a, an issue you're having, some people, they're, they're, like, you know, they don't get along well, so well with sintered pads, maybe it's yeah. Try some organic ones. Yeah, that's a good point actually. Different pad sort of friction of them mm. beds in very differently. Mm. Sintered can be a pain because they're quite hard. They do take a bit longer to bed in. Yeah. Um, and they will howl if you don't bed them in properly, which is good enough reason just to sack them off, get a fresh pair. <laughs> yeah. Because you end up not wanting to use the brakes because you're embarrassed to use your brakes. And yes, you're, totally. You're going to kill yourself. So. <laughs> um, take your time bedding your brakes in. Again, uh, I'd avoid the water for sure um, mm. if you've got fresh pads. We did do a video on what to do if your pads and your disc rotors are glazed. Of course, it's not guaranteed it's going to fix, but if you want to effectively start fresh with yours, you can throw a link to that video in the description underneath. So it's definitely worth a look if you feel like they're, they're past their best, but you still want to try and recover them a bit. Uh, check that out and good luck. Yeah, nice. So, Doddy, I've got a question for you from Razvan Gabriel, and he says, Hello, I'm wondering, does the Nuke Proof Scout 27.5 fits 29ers also. If yes, do you know how much clearance it has and maximum tire width? Considering getting a Scout 27.5 for the plus tires and having a spare set of wheels for more XC focus races. Thanks in advance. Right, okay, so I've had the 29er and now I've got a 27 and a half. Um, the 29er, you can fit a 27 and a half up to 2.8 in there. I reckon you could probably get a tiny bit bigger, but it's gonna be tight. Um, not tried it, so we could try that and find out. But with the 27 and a half, there's still loads of clearance, but I don't think you'd get a 29 in there. Mm. If you did, it'd be like so close to that seat tube. Um, we'll have to try that one just to see yeah. if it will fit, but I'm not sure to be honest. Because you do get a lot of bikes that go 29 slash 27 plus. Yeah. But then going the other way, I guess they must make the stay shorter. Yeah, I'll tell you what, um, you caught me out on this one. So what we're gonna do is we'll actually try it with a few different tires we've got here, a few different sizes, 
and in the next ask we'll pick this up again and we'll just show you have a little demo just to show you mm. uh, how close it actually is if it does go in yeah right, that's the best way to do yeah. it yeah also if you do look on the nukeproof website it does say that both frames 27 or 29 do have the same tire clearance of 2.8 which would be a plus tire i guess yeah so but but a, 27 to and a half to get pluses, the 29 yeah. in, into the, the 29 yeah. is still bigger than a plus. The 29 is yes. nearer a three inch tire on a yeah. 27 and a half, so it's going to be close. Yeah, we'll try it and we'll let you know on the next week's ask. All right, next up's from Smart Cookie 101. Can you put a tapered steerer tube in if you currently have a straight one? It depends on the steerer tube of the frame. Yes. Assuming the steerer tube is straight. Then, so basically it doesn't flare out towards the bottom, mm. then sadly not. I, mean, I think, I mean, I'm guessing by yeah. description of this, with your straight steel tube, your frame is purely designed around that. You yeah. can get more modern frames that can house both. Mm -hmm. um, like a 44 mil head tube, you can actually get both in there. It doesn't look like you can, but um, if you're asking this question, it tells me that your frame probably only accepts a straight steel tube. Yeah. It's pretty unlikely. And it's a bit frustrating. I mean, you can still get Straight, tube, straight steerer tube forks, but they've mainly converged on the standard 1.5 yeah. to 1 8th taper. Yeah. Although it was really interesting. Can you remember when the first taper forks came out and Rockshox and Fox had their taper going up the different lengths? And sometimes uh, yeah, it would it actually- It wouldn't always fit in the frame. It wouldn't always fit in the frame. So yeah. we're actually really lucky now that we have kind of got Genuine this Genuine standard, yeah. We have got a good standard, but- Well, it's funny, because even that coming from 1.5, and you have those massive dirty yeah, stems. The the like, it's stuff. really wow. stiff, but why do you need that extra weight? And yeah. I forget who it was that did it first, did the tapered. I'm like, mm. why don't we just do this? Yeah, it is bloody it's good. great idea, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, what's, with steel frames, even a high-end steel frame now, would you expect to find a straight or a taper, do you think? No, nah, not not often. Not even on road, really, these yeah. days. You yeah. know, everyone's making the most of it. It gives you more sort of stiffness back and forth under mm. braking. And if that transmits, you know, better braking power to your tire, it's got to be a good thing. Yeah, totally. Um, now, I think you're, you're going to be quite unlucky there. You're best off actually taking that to your nearest bike shop because they'll tell you just on seeing it because mm. it's something, even if you took a photo of it, we're not going to be able to identify that without seeing it in the flesh. Yeah. Um, so unlucky, I'm afraid. <clears throat> Next, we have a question from Miles Alley. And he says, would it be a good idea to build a downhill bike with pedal kickback built into the suspension design? Uh -huh. My explanation is you pump into the bike and keep your feet level so you can gain forward energy without pedaling, if that makes sense. Now, uh, I believe we were talking about something similar the other day. Yeah. And I mean, it was like a crime watch reconstruction, Doddy explaining this bike yeah. road. Just, oh, and it through pumps, it just, oh, oh. Okay, so, th yeah, the bike you're talking about is, uh, was a Kiwi. Mm. Uh, it was a handmade steel frame and they used to make amazing hardtails and some very good suspension bikes, by all accounts. But this particular one, the guy came to see us with, had a very high pivot. So high, in fact, that if it was out today and you put an idler wheel on it, it'd look pretty modern. Yeah. Except it didn't. And the whole point of an idler wheel is to avoid the whole chain growth thing, of which by having a high pivot, you get extreme amount of chain growth and you get the pedal kick back, your rear mm. mech wants to pull itself off the bike completely, snapping chains, etc., which actually happened on that bike. We uh, bent the, the mech hanger so bad that the, me the mech essentially went into the spokes and pulled mm -hmm. itself off the bike. Um, and at the time, I don't know if it was a designer or a marketing person or representative from the company, I think they tried to tell us or insinuate that that was built into the bike for exactly what you're talking about, and it's like, so I don't buy that. It doesn't work. No, yeah. it doesn't work because it's, it hinders you too much in other areas. Yeah. Um, so I would just say straight out, no. And you want suspension to have no bearing on what's going on with your pedals. Yeah, totally. That's something that's been, you know, it's not a motorbike where you've got throttle to get it done and you mm -hmm. can figure other things other things out, you've got a pedal thing at the end of the day. Yeah, and especially when you take into, into fact, if you have the the transmission and suspension interwoven with each other completely, yeah. then you're taking braking forces as well. Yeah. And you're going down and you're, every time you hit a but you know. Maybe. Well, you can, it ratchets your pedals yeah, around, exactly, you know, yeah. and whilst you might think you could use that coming out of a turn, the other effect is if you're coming into like a choppy turn, it's gonna be like forcing your ankles mm. back off. You know, your yeah. feet can come off the pedals, you know, as I just explained, the rear mech is going to put itself forwards. It's just not a good setup to have. And it is really interesting though, just how much force and what you said about braking components. Yeah. How much force both the rider has, but also how much force can be delivered to the rider by, via the suspension. Yeah, There's absolutely. a lot of very high impact things yeah. going on there. 
which is um, why it's really taken until now for suspension designs to be this good. Mm. I think mostly we're pretty lucky. You know, you'll find it hard to pick a bike that's got a bad suspension design. Mm -hmm. There's definitely better ones out there than, you know, than the average ones, but it's not like it used to be where you could still buy things with terrible suspension platforms. Um, we'll have that another day, actually. I think yes. some of the worst designs ever. We'll have a bit of a laugh at some. <laughs> There we go, there's another Ask GMBN Tech in the bag. Any questions, uh, anything you want to know, let us know in those comments and don't forget to use the hashtags. Um, I'm going to throw you to Henry's video on silencing a bike right down here, cable rattle in particular. Oh yeah, that's pretty cool. And I'm also going to throw down to your podcast. So maybe while you're getting your bike quiet, you can listen to ah. that in the background, the synergy of two. And yeah, don't forget to like and subscribe. Really important to do because we can keep these content coming. Yeah, and give us a thumbs up. Cheers, guys.